I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Last week I told a story about who I showed myself to be in a critical moment. In that story, I didn't like the person that I saw that I was. And in that moment, Jesus appeared to me and guided me in a new direction. The process was unpleasant, difficult, but it ultimately led me to new life. Life that was more abundant than it was before. I shared one particular story, but the truth is that kind of transformation has happened to me many times. Not all of them has been as dramatic as seeing the risen Christ sitting on a sidewalk in Manhattan. More often they are subtle, happening in ways that I don't even realize sometimes until later. More often they do not take place in a single moment, but over months or years or decades of growth and struggle. Perhaps you too can look back and see in your own lives the processes like this that have happened to you. Following Jesus is a journey. Too often we talk about discipleship as if it were a destination. As if once you get there, once you get baptized or repent or make some sort of decision to follow, that we have arrived. But the truth is that discipleship is a journey, a way of traveling. Not somewhere we're traveling to. As we pick out the path that we take through this life, discipleship is the way in which we choose where to put our feet next. And one way that we describe how we do that is with the metaphor of listening for Jesus' voice. St. John believes that because all creation came into being through him, we all belong to Jesus and somewhere, on some level, we all know his voice. He believes that something deep inside of us recognizes him. If that's the case, we're left to ask, why do so many of us not walk in that way? Why do humans do so many things apart from God's will? In this story, Jesus talks about thieves and bandits who slip in over the wall of the sheepfold, so to speak. They also call to the sheep to follow, and sometimes the sheep do. But why is that? Don't, doesn't he also say that they will run from strangers because they don't know their voices? The story that we get today in St. John's Gospel follows immediately after the story of Jesus healing a man born blind. Remember that one? The disciples ask him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You might also remember that throughout that story, the man is questioned again and again by leaders of the synagogue as to how he was healed. And when he tells the truth that this man Jesus healed him and that he must come from God, those same leaders become angry and throw him out. They excommunicate him. Seems a bit drastic, maybe, doesn't it? I wonder why they do that. In my experience, whenever people act rashly like that, it often boils down to either anger or fear. And sometimes those are the same thing. I wonder what the synagogue leaders might have been afraid of in this formerly blind man. Did they worry that his story would cause other people to follow Jesus? Were they concerned about conflict and division arising in their congregation? Were they trying to protect their orthodox beliefs from this heretic? At the end of the story, the man once again meets Jesus and sees fully who he is. And Jesus notes that this man who was born blind can see who Jesus is, but that the synagogue leaders who have full use of their eyes are being blinded by something. At that point, some nearby Pharisees ask, uh, take offense, and they ask Jesus, Surely we are not blind, are we? Maybe they are angry, too. Maybe they are afraid. I wonder what they have to be angry about. Are they upset because Jesus seems to be attacking their system of belief? 
questioning their ability to know God? One common thread I see running through this story is that, for whatever reason, these people all seem to feel threatened by Jesus and what he's doing. This happens throughout all the Gospels, not just John's. People perceive Jesus and his message as a threat, and they react with anger and ultimately violence. At the end of this very chapter, this chapter, the story of I am the gate and I am the good shepherd, people pick up rocks to stone him. Following Jesus' voice is easy when things are good, right? It's when the chips are down, when there is too much at stake that those other voices become harder to ignore. Jesus' voice always draws us towards the cross. And sometimes there are things in life that we would rather not see crucified. In those moments, the ways of the thieves and bandits can seem more expedient. Sometimes it's easier or quicker or more effective to respond with violence, whether physical or emotional or verbal, or to run away or to manipulate people and situations to get what we want. I wonder, if we're being honest with ourselves, how often this may be true of us. Maybe we don't respond by picking up rocks to do harm, but how often do we respond to threats or conflict by defending ourselves? How often do we attack those who are against us by writing them off as malicious or stupid? When we feel threatened by another, whose voice do we follow? Jesus reminds us here that the voice of the shepherd, his voice, the voice that calls us, calls to us, and which we hear in our deepest, inmost being, that that voice may be calling us to the cross, but that that's not where the journey ends, is it? The cross is the necessary entrance to the empty tomb. The way of Jesus doesn't call us to death. It calls us through death into new life. Those other voices, they may promise us immediate safety or victory or relief, but ultimately they cannot lead to life. And we see this in the stories, right? The people who are trying hardest to save and protect their religion and their heritage, their nation and their people, ultimately turn to the violent way of Rome. Rome, who is their oppressor, remember, to accomplish what they want. And as powerful as Rome is, all Rome can do is kill. And that's what they do. They kill Jesus. But that's where Jesus shows us what true power is. The power not to take life, but to give it. This is the power with which the voice of the shepherd calls us. As hard as the path may be, it is the path of abundant life, not of death and destruction and thievery. But with so many voices calling to us, how do we know which ones to follow? Jesus says today, I am the gate. The gate, he says, is the only place where the people who are supposed to be in the sheepfold, the shepherds, enter. The letter of 1 Peter says the same. Jesus sets us an example to follow. Jesus not only shows us what it looks like to suffer with an awareness of God, he also shows us what it looks like to live in that awareness. See, one of the things I notice about the antagonists in this story, the synagogue leaders and the Pharisees and the chief priests and the Romans, they are all trying to tightly hold on to something, to control the situation. Jesus, on the other hand, chooses to let go. He places himself at the mercy and in the power of the people and the systems that are trying to silence him. The phrase he will use in the verses following today's gospel reading is, he lays down his life. When he says that, I don't think he's talking about self-destruction. 
I don't even think he's talking about self-sacrifice. I think he's talking about what we would call detachment. Detachment is the idea of holding on to things lightly. To us comfortable people, that might sound like losing, like pushing away the people or things we care about most, but it's actually kind of the opposite. Detachment is more about holding most tightly to the one thing that really matters and letting everything else that gets in the way take its proper place on the periphery. In these stories, I see people holding on tightly to things like belief or orthodoxy, national identity or heritage, power and control. They hold those things so tightly that they can no longer hear the voice of the shepherd. <coughs> but Jesus, on the other hand, holds on to everything in his life loosely. He's willing to let go of it if need be. And that willingness allows him to follow where God calls and to do what is required and ultimately even to rise from the grave. Detachment is less about saying no to the things of the world than it is about saying yes to God and entrusting in God's yes to us. In falling ever deeper into that yes, even when it's frightening. Jesus entrusts his entire being to this yes. And that is what makes him able to do what he does. That's the invitation I hear to us in these stories today, to trust in that yes, to be willing to fall into it. Suffering and conflict are inevitable and unavoidable in life. The call of faith is not to seek out suffering or to endure it needlessly, as some have interpreted these passages, but to trust in God's yes, even to the point that suffering and conflict do not have the power to deter us from trusting what God is doing and following in that way. <coughs> First Peter describes how Jesus conducts himself in suffering, and those attributes are a great place to start practicing, but the real power of that passage is not in telling us what to do, but in describing where the voice of the shepherd will lead us and how that voice is forming us if we're able to let go of everything that gets in the way of our following it. During this Easter season, we are reminded where that voice is leading us and that it has the power to deliver. The God who raised Christ from the dead is the God who leads us to new life as well. We see that new life daily, not just once at the end of our lives. And so I wonder, can we, will we, trust that this new life is for us as well? I invite you to rise as you're able, as we join together in proclaiming the good news in the words of our hymn, number 526, God is here. 